Uh, okay, so last time uh, we were hopefully getting close to finishing up our discussion before we got into a flash tangent. Um, we talked about some data representation languages like XML, HTML, uh, XHTML, um, uh, HTML being what our web browsers understand, XML being a data definition language um, that looks kind of like this guy up here. So this is what XML might be. And when we say data representation, notice that I'm using this tag-based language, opening person tag, closing person tag, opening name tag, closing name tag, uh, to describe and represent data. So in this case, we're trying to represent a person who has a name, Mike, and has an email address, this. Okay, so we're representing data, and this is a standardized format for it. Similarly, JSON is kind of our more modern approach um, to uh, data representation. Not that there's anything wrong, um, well, not that XML is broken, but uh, you can see how much uh, stuff there is here to represent only two pieces of information, whereas JSON is much simpler to represent those same two pieces of information. Uh, similarly, one other thing I might throw in there regarding JSON is JSON supports arrays, which are collections of objects. Um, so that would be another perk of JSON where that type of thing is not uh, possible inside of uh, uh, XML. Uh, you can just have a whole bunch of objects in a row in XML and read them in or something like that, but uh, JSON actually has a special caveat to the language that supports uh, arrays. So if there was kind of an improvement besides formatting, it would be this idea of uh, supporting arrays. Um, HTML5 and Flash are the things we were kind of talking about right at the end of class uh, last time. Um, these would not be data representation languages. These are, um, uh, even though HTML and HTML5 look very similar, HTML5 is really a uh, standard name for a suite of technologies. And HTML5 really came about as an answer to Flash. So let's talk about Flash here for uh, um, uh, a few minutes. Uh, and this kind of becomes an interesting, uh, you know, history lesson, I guess. In the early days of, uh, well, when our web browsers um, started becoming very, very popular and people were using the internet all the time and there was many, many, many more people on the internet and the idea of collaborating in like these online poker games and stuff like that became popular, uh, Flash really came into its own where people were able to write basically video games that lived inside of web browsers that people can come and uh, initially play just single player games, but now nothing single player anymore, right? You know, almost every game requires some sort of internet connection and, uh, to play. Well, Flash is really a language for embedding um, dynamic graphical code into a web browser. Okay, so if we kind of give a, uh, a definition to Flash. Embedding dynamic, I might say visual code, um, into a web page. Now, it's important to understand the distinction. Web browsers don't natively understand Flash. Web browsers natively understand HTML as well as JavaScript. That's what they know. If you want to support Flash, you've probably seen this before, you go to a web page that has Flash, you don't have Flash installed on your web browser, it uh, gives you an error saying you must, include, you know, must go download this plugin to make this work. So you click download the plugin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, kind of the competitor to Flash more recently is uh, something from Microsoft called Silverlight. Probably seen that as well. Same deal. Same deal. All right. So uh, um, when you download uh, Flash or Silverlight, you're really downloading a separate software application that happens to have a plugin for your web browser. So as our web browsers evolved, they created the ability to have plugins made for them so that third party places like Silverlight and like Flash, um, as well as a lot of other uh, um, tools, could uh, add on to the capabilities of your web browser without your web browser being uh, responsible for providing any additional functionality. Web browsers even today still only support HTML and JavaScript. 
Um, okay. Um, although I could throw HTML5 into that equation because they are HTML5 compliant, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So kind of an um, uh, interesting history lesson with Flash is it was really, really, really popular for a long, long time. And then it kind of fell out of favor. And really, it fell out of favor during the whole uh, iOS versus Android war. So when um, uh, iPhone, iOS came out about a year before Android. Android you know, followed them by about a year. So uh, when Android came out, it supported Flash right out, right out of the gate. Well, iPhone never supported Flash. Even to this day, they never supported Flash. Uh, and why was this? Well, a lot of people ripped on Apple, saying, well, you know, you need Flash for these websites, blah, blah, blah. And I think I probably asked the question last time, how many of you have ever had an Android phone that had Flash on it? Um, did anybody respond? I think you didn't you say you had a, a uh, at your store, you had somebody who had come in a while ago that had Flash. And it's like unusable on a smartphone. It's just not made for smartphones. And part of the thing was uh, Flash, the mobile version of Flash was based on the desktop version, which means it assumed you were plugged into power. Flash would absolutely kill your battery life on a smartphone. Kill it. Uh, and if you want to see uh, it, if you've ever run Flash on a laptop, so not even a, a mobile phone, on a laptop without the laptop being plugged into the wall, the battery life is like a tenth of what it would be. It's really bad. Flash just kills your battery life. Not because Flash is an innately bad program. Flash is actually a very old program. It's been around for a long time. We kind of forget how long the internet's been around now. And it was built at a different time period when we weren't really thinking about battery, battery life and things like that. Um, so Flash is really a battery hog, which doesn't uh, bode well for mobile phones. All right, so when Android first came out, it supported Flash. So the browser allowed for it. And this actually becomes problematic. Um, you know, uh, one of the big complaints people had about Android, and even still have today, but to a lesser extent, is battery life. Android phones tend to have worse battery life uh, than Apple phones. Um, so what do they do? The Android phones claim they have more, you know, they claim a certain number of hours, but then they have to put bigger batteries in them, things like that. Uh, more recently, they've streamlined this and their battery life is substantially better than it used to be. But in any case, if you go back, uh, when you visit a web page on a, a, a desktop computer or something like that, what percent of web pages would you guesstimate has some flash on it? Go ahead. 75? So a lot. With it, is that fair? You go to a lot of web pages and they have something dancing on the screen somewhere, right? Okay, well, when you open up a web page in Android, on an Android app that supports Flash, those things that aren't even things you're going to interact with. You know, it's one thing if you're going there to play online poker, but if you're just looking at this page to get today's weather report and you leave that page running, and it's got a little flash doohickey up top that's you know, streaming some something. Uh, that's just killing your battery life. And then on top of that, to make it even worse, Android's multitasking model um, is a desktop multitasking model. So I mean, you can, um, you know, if you look at Android bragging rights, when Android first came out, it supported Flash. And it supported multitasking. And both of these features were features that all the Android commercials used to rip on Apple. Because Apple didn't support Flash and they also didn't support multitasking. And what's interesting about this is we take multitasking for granted with our computers today. We have to roll back pretty far for our desktop computers before we didn't have multitasking. We had to go back to like Windows 3.1. So our first multitasking operating system um, for consumers was really like Windows 95, where you can actually open up a program and minimize it and all that jazz. So we really take the idea of having more than one program open at once for granted on desktop computers. Well, smartphones were a whole new breed. Apple didn't support having more than one program open at once uh, when the iPhone first came out. Uh, keep in mind, there was also a lot less programs, but 
doesn't matter. Let's just use it in today's world. Um, only you can only have one thing open at once, whatever was currently on, on the screen. Android did support multitasking, and a lot of people said, oh, that's a good thing. Well, Android is based on the Linux operating system, and therefore has a very good multitasking model that assumes you are plugged into power. So once again, they're leveraging an existing technology that is perfectly acceptable if you're plugged into the wall or you have a gigantic battery. Okay, well, to a, I guess to a lesser extent, so a lesser extent, a gigantic battery for multitasking that smartphone. And so when the, how many of you have ever, how many of you are Android users in here? Okay, a third of the class or so. Uh, how many of you have ever had the experience where you had to go get one of those apps that was in charge of closing other apps? Okay, so uh, this is less common today, but because of Android's multitasking model, uh, in the early days to make your battery life better, what you had to do is you had to download an app, you launched the app, and the app's job was to close other apps. Because you had all these apps running in the background that were just killing your battery life. They were using your CPU, using battery life, and you didn't even care about those apps. So again, let's throw a number to something. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, any kind of smartphone user, let's say you open up 10 apps. When you switch away from that app, you put it into the, the quote, background. Out of that 10, what, maybe two of them, you actually care if it's still running in the background? You know, maybe you have a music streaming app or something like that that you want it to keep playing the music or something like that. But generally speaking, isn't it most of the time when you get, go away from an app, you're done with it? Right? I mean, let's think about sports scores or something like that. You know, if you're going to go back into the app, you need to refresh it anyways to get the updated score. You don't want to see the score from 15 minutes ago. Um, um, speaking of sports scores, it was a funny thing. It was at a... This is a good Christian worldview point, I think, or maybe an anti-Christian worldview. I'm not sure. It was at a Bible study on um, a Saturday night. We do a, a, a dinner thing with our pastor and a couple of other families, and uh, the Wisconsin game was on. Um, but, you know, we had this thing was planned a couple months ago. It's, we call it Upper Room. So it was like us and three other families. We do dinner and then a Bible study. And so we're sitting there, and I'm sitting next to the pastor, and, you know, he's like running this Bible study, and... He's asking what's the score, <laughs> and I'm like turning my phone to him and showing him the score. So, I don't know, is that good for a pastor to be doing that? <laughs> Seemed to work out. He would ask a question, and then while somebody else was babbling, that's when he would turn to me. It's it pretty funny. Okay, well, in any case, most of the time we put apps into the background, we don't want them running, right? That's not important to us. In Android, they're always running. They're always running when they're in the background because it's based on a desktop operating system. If I minimize this application, or I just switch over to a different application, I know Keynote's still running, right? So I could just flip right back to it and everything's still good because this guy was getting CPU time. And I, that, that's important to me on a desktop or a laptop uh, operating system because there's a good chance I'm going to be switching back and forth between apps. On a smartphone, that's not how we use them, correct? So... The thing that Android was really bragging about in the early days was also the thing that people complained about the most because the battery life was, was terrible. Um, so kind of an interesting thing. Apple was very late to the game with uh, multitasking on the phones. And even today, Apple's multitasking is a lot different than Android's multitasking. Um, the way multitasking works on iOS... An app may choose to take advantage of one of the um, operating system hooks available for doing things in the background. For example, one of those hooks is play music. Okay, so Apple tried to identify the 
six or seven things that an app may want to do in the background. GPS locations, things like that. Um, the best example for us is music playing stuff, right? So sometimes you want to have an app that goes to the background. You want the music to keep playing, okay? Um, I mean, I don't listen to a lot of music. I listen to audiobooks. So when I'm in the car for a long trip and I have my GPS going, I want my audiobook playing, but I want to see the GPS. Okay, before I'd had the multitasking-esque feature, I had to, if I wanted to play the audiobook, I had to be watching the, have the audiobook app up. So iOS apps, when the app goes into the background, the app itself, whoever wrote it, had to choose whether or not it will take advantage of any of those background hooks. And they could implement it. So by default, apps do not do anything in the background. You know, certain apps can choose to take advantage of something in the background, and then they're only using the battery life associated with that one hook, and they're actually utilizing the operating system itself to do all that. It's requesting to play music. That makes sense? It's requesting to, to um, keep a certain, you know, a, a music stream or something live and going. Uh, so it's going to use a lot less battery life because it's only using aspects of the operating system for playing that in the background. Whereas an Android app, every application is runs in the background is in charge of its own stuff. Okay. Now, for other applications, sports cores, things like that, we rely on our mobile phones today for like push notifications, right? So Apple came out with these push notifications. Now everybody supports the push notification idea. So push notifications, the way those work, is an app registers with the cloud and says, I'm interested in getting push notifications for this app. So now some computer up there in the sky that's plugged into the wall is keeping track of things that you might be interested in. And now your phone itself has registered with push notifications with that server. So if you've said, I want to get updated buck scores for the NBA, whenever they're, you know, maybe it's on the quarter or something like that, the push notification server, it knows about your phone. It then sends a communication back to your phone saying, pop up the current score at the end of the, at the half or something like that. Okay, so that's not actually the app running in the background listening for something. That's your phone constantly being available to the cloud thing and the cloud actually pushing it to your app rather than the, the phone pulling it from the cloud. Okay, it makes sense? So that's kind of another thing that fakes multitasking. It's something that gives us some of the ability we want for multitasking. Well, it doesn't affect the battery life? Uh, I would say generally no. Uh, I mean, everything on a phone is going to affect your battery life somewhat. Yeah. So when it has to, when something pushes to it and this guy receives, so it's going to take not up... Like uh, not like true multitasking. Your phone is not sitting there constantly saying, is there an update? Is there an update? Is there an update? Is there an update? It's not doing that over and over again. It's just sitting there and it's registered with the cloud server saying, I'm interested in updates. Send one to me when you have one. And only when it sends it and this guy receives it does your phone actually use power for that, for that task. Okay, so these are all solutions for having something like this that has a battery. Okay, and that's why over the last couple of years, as, the, as these technologies have continued to evolve, all of our phones, Apple and the Android phones, have gotten thinner and thinner and fit thinner, right? Uh, which now allows us, I mean, that's, the, I mean, one reason Apple has the new, the big screens now is to compete with the other guys. They always said you didn't need the big screen until people said they liked big screens. So now Apple has the big screen, right? And the good news is with the bigger screen, you get more space in there for more battery, too. Um, so it can kind of keep up, uh, uh, keep up there. Um, but you've already seen a lot of the other uh, phones from you know the Android side of things, getting thinner and thinner, meaning they have to have they they are shipping with uh, smaller batteries and lighter batteries, so they don't the phone isn't as heavy because now they they've taken advantage of some mobile friendly technology. It's not that Apple reinvented the wheel; somebody had to figure out the battery life issue, right? So Apple came up with a couple of good ideas. Android then took some of those ideas and said, "Here's even a one up on that." So now they're both actually playing in the "Hey, battery life matters" game. Kind of an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting thing. Um, so in the beginning, Android, the whole multitasking thing was a battery life uh, fiasco. Flash was even worse. So these Android apps, this is where I was going before with the, you know, you open up a website and many, many, many websites have something Flash based running on them. Well, whether it's an entire poker game that's running or this little tiny thing that's running here. 
if it's the flash uh, plug-in that's inefficient, that's a battery hog, if, if that's the guy, and this thing is, has a little dude dancing around on the screen, even when your browser's in the background on an Android device, oh, your battery's dead. You can literally open up one web page that had flash on it, close it so you're back at your desktop, let the phone screen go off. That thing's still running. And you open it up and you're wondering why you had 32% battery life. Okay, so, you know, kind of not compatible with how our, um, uh, how, we, how we use mobile devices. Okay, so Flash, while it was supported, was uh, two problems. Terrible battery life and didn't really function well. So you weren't going to take your uh, smartphone and go and uh, um, uh, play one of those online poker games uh, on a web browser. It just wasn't going to function very well. You know, in a pinch, if you had to make your fantasy football pick, maybe, maybe, <laughs> in a pinch. <laughs> All right, so, but still, even then, probably not something you wanted to, you wanted to deal with. Okay, so... Um, that's the difference between taking an approach uh, based off of past knowledge of desktop and moving it to future thinking, future thinking stuff on how do we do mobile better, okay? And really the biggest, uh, um, if there's one company that's probably the worst at this, it's probably Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft keeps as much of their desktop stuff in line through everything and then just hopes that, that people don't notice that the battery life is terrible. Um, Android maybe has had more of an excuse um, where uh, Google really had to come to the table pretty quick to compete with the new smartphone market. So they had to put together this brand new operating system that was supported from a lot of different people, not just Google, since it's an open source project. So they didn't really have control over the whole thing. Given a little bit more time and a little bit more forethought, I'm quite confident Google probably would have put out something that was a little bit more battery friendly day one. Just nature of the beast. Um, okay. So in any case, uh, Flash, very, very, very good product. Very, very, very bad if you're running off a of battery. Okay, so I, know, I mentioned last time that Android supported Flash. If you have an Android device today, you don't, you don't have Flash. They, they took it off. Okay. So your battery life isn't as bad as it used to be. Um, okay, so Flash is gone. Um, multitasking is mostly gone. But there's actually some interesting things. Um, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Android multitasking had your applications always running in the background. Apple never had them running in the background, only had those little hooks to the operating system. Well, now with iOS 8, Apple has snuck in the ability for some of your apps to run a little bit in the background. So, you know, the examples they use, like Facebook, maybe you want to have it update your profile, um, you know, refresh it every 15 minutes or something like that. So when you open it, it already has the newest stuff there. You don't just have to sit. Also checking email, stuff like that. So they're saying, our batteries are pretty good today. Maybe it's worth losing 10 minutes of total battery life over across a day to have your apps be a little bit more responsive. When you first open them, they have their stuff a little bit more up to date. So Apple's kind of shifted maybe a little bit more towards the Android side with, uh, uh, with that model. Um, okay. So last time we were talking about this idea of cross-platform tools. Uh, so Flash would be an example of that where you're using a browser, you write the, something in Flash, and it'll, whether you're on Linux or the Mac or PC, as long as you had a Flash plugin, it would work. Um, so that would be more of a historical model for this. HTML5 would be our more modern model. It actually would, would fit across more platforms. So let's call HTML5, this guy here, as the modern Flash. Okay, so this is something that does not rely on a uh, third-party plugin. Uh, Adobe makes the plugin for Flash, HTML5 as a standard. Um, uh, perhaps... Uh, the war between, I mean, what you really had was you had Flash, which dominated the dynamic uh, graphical stuff inside of web pages. And it was very good, but bad for battery life. HTML5 was the new kid, but not well adopted. Because at that point in time, 
mobile wasn't the dominant force that it is today. You know, today, whenever somebody makes something, the idea of it being mobile is their is the first thing that comes to mind, whether it's a phone or whether it's a laptop. Okay, those are our dominant things now. Desktops are not cool anymore. People still have desktops, but really, you only need a desktop if you're like a gamer. Uh, outside of that, you can pull off uh, everything you need with a laptop, and even the gaming thing you can pull off pretty well with uh, with the laptops. Um, so our mindset is different today. But when you roll back when Flash was still on Android, and Apple refused to bring Flash onto the um, uh, onto their operating system, and a lot of the technical world would look down at Apple for for this decision, thought they were you know, being, um, uh, they were hurting a lot of companies because these companies weren't uh, able to deliver their content on the iPhone unless they made changes to their content, okay, because their content was currently in Flash. Um, and Apple really has a history of, of what I'm about to talk about, and this is this idea of strong-arming change. Sometimes it's good, uh, sometimes it just seems like they're being a bully. So in this particular case, you might say it was probably pretty good. HTML5 really wasn't popular at the time, uh, but Apple's kind of a big fish, right? They're, they're a big deal in technology. So if you have this one company that has a hugely popular mobile platform saying, we're not going to support your crap, instead we support this other stuff, all of a sudden, if these guys want to play over here, they have to start supporting that other stuff. So they were having to write it in HTML5 anyways that they wanted their content to be on the uh, uh, the iPhone. And really, the, probably the catalyst was really for the iPad. Uh, that was probably the point where it turned the, uh, the corner where content like that made more sense. Um, you know, you would have a much better chance of playing one of your online poker games on an iPad versus an iPhone just because of the screen size. Something like that. So really, Apple strong-arming here probably is what made HTML5 come to fruition in terms of it being the new standard. And really, they're probably the, mo the, the white flag, the moment of success was when uh, Adobe, the makers of uh, Creative Suite that also has, that's the, the makers of Flash, and they also have their Flash Builder. They had an export tool for Flash Builder added that exported Flash to HTML5. So that was probably the white flag. When your comp competition basically says, We'd like people to keep using our tool, but we'll export to the other guy's stuff. <laughs> so that was probably the uh, um, the death knell, if you if you will. But some other interesting things that Apple's done that I don't know, seem more like bullying to me. Um, a good example would be uh, uh, like Wall Street Journal on iPad. Um, you know, it's in the so so a lot of people use iPads and, and other tablets for reading. Right? So that's kind of their way to digest news and things like that. And the Wall Street Journal is kind of the most public one of, uh, of this uh, fiasco. But um, Apple made it so that the Wall Street Journal and the papers like that could not deliver their content on the iPad unless they offered at least the same deal as they offered external to the iPad for subscriptions. So let's say the Wall Street Journal charges $30 a month for their paper. Okay? If you want to buy their paper externally, okay? Now they come out with their iPad app and they want you to be able to put in, uh, they want you to be able to receive that paper through the, uh, the iPad, putting your username and password in. Apple's like, yeah, no problem. But you must also offer Wall Street Journal subscriptions through the iPad. And it has to be at least as good of a price as you have external to the iPad. Okay, which basically means now you're going to start picking up Wall Street Journal subscribers through the iPad, right? Well, the catch is Apple takes 30%. So now you have all these Wall Street Journal subscribers, um, new ones and also old ones who switched their subscription over to the iPad because it was easier for billing, just gets charged to your iTunes account, giving 30% of their subscription, well, probably 25% of their subscription because Apple had to handle the credit card fees, but... Still, a lot of their subscription money, instead of it going to the Wall Street Journal, is now going into Apple's pocket. So if we say Wall Street Journal has uh, uh, 10 million subscribers, well, and let's say 3 million of them, 4 million of them are on iPad, that means 25% of those 4 million subscribers' money is going into Apple's pocket instead of the Wall Street Journal's pocket. And then repeat that over a lot of different publications and stuff like that. 
Kind of an interesting model. Not surprising Apple's so rich. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know if I really... It's certainly Apple's right to do that. Seems a little bullish to me. Um, but, I guess Wall Street Journal wants to have it on the iPad. It's the price you pay. Yeah. It seems like Microsoft kind of has the same idea as Windows. Well, you mean in terms of the licensing, that them getting paid for Windows um, when it gets shipped on a computer? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Uh, well, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's Microsoft invented the idea of licensing software. Nice. I mean, that's that's their that's their model from day from day one. Uh, they're the ones who convinced IBM that the money was. Well, IBM thought the money was in hardware. Microsoft decided, well, we're going to make money off basically vaporware, bits and bytes. That's where our money comes from. We write it once and we can reproduce it instantly. No big deal. And we get paid every single time. That's what Microsoft has been doing uh, forever. Um, you know, and then you take that Apple model one step further. I mean, they're doing the same thing with the app stores. So is Android. You put an app on the app store uh, and that app makes, uh, um, let's say it's a $5 app. Apple gets 30% of that. How many, how many apps are on the uh, App Store? Google gets 30% of theirs as well. So how many mobile apps are out there in the mobile app stores today? Round down to a zillion? Okay, so, and, and all of them have a, re well, a high percentage of them have a revenue stream of some type. Whether it's you buy it first um, and Apple gets their 30% then, or you get it for free and then there's in-app purchases of which Apple gets 30% of that, or it's supported by advertisements, which somebody's getting 30% of that. You know, and Apple has their version of that called iAd, where they get 30%. So somebody's, somebody's always getting paid from all these other people's uh, creativity. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, okay, so continuing going down this path here, going towards this idea of cross-platform tools, there is a um, desire to be able to write something once and have it live on as many platforms as possible. With that comes a trade-off. Typically, when you write something in one language and have it translated into five other languages, you're giving up something. That is, you have to play to the lowest common denominator of those five other languages, let's say. Okay, Maybe that's a big deal, but you're still playing with that trade-off. Is it more important that my product is delivered across multiple platforms, or is it more important that my product is um, m the most, the highest performance and most polished on every one of those platforms? Those are trade-offs. Typically, games, we want to be as uh, um, polished and um, uh, high performance as possible. But business applications, uh, things like that, we care less about that because our computers are so fast, it'll just feel fast, correct? Now, there's actually an interesting connection, though, when we talk about cross-platform as it relates to um, games. So, and I'm talking about more of our serious, serious games, not, uh, not Angry Birds and stuff. I'm talking like Battlefield type, high graphic, uh, high frame rate type games. Um, one of the issues in the early days of gaming on desktop was, you know, typically if you were making a video game, it would come out for Windows first. That was your biggest platform by a lot. Well, games for Windows were written in something called DirectX. That was Microsoft's uh, 3D, well, 2D and 3D uh, um, game library, or uh, graphics library, let's put it that way. So it was written in DirectX. The Mac didn't have access to DirectX, and it's a Microsoft product, they used a standard called OpenGL. Okay, OpenGL is an open source standard. Now, Direct uh, Windows also supported OpenGL, but there were some beneficial things of writing your games for Windows using DirectX, um, specifically because that, in, that exact, in that model, Microsoft controlled both sides of the coin. They control the operating system, and they control the um, uh, the, the DirectX software, so those two can work very seamlessly together and they can take certain shortcuts for making things happen quickly. Okay, fair enough. Um, you might say, well, if I'm, a, if I'm a video game developer, why wouldn't I just write it in OpenGL? 
That way it would automatically work on both. Make sense? So here we'll put this is Microsoft and this is Apple. So we could say DirectX slash OpenGL. So we might argue, why not just write everything in OpenGL? That way it's available on Mac and Apple with little change, small changes. Well, why do you think they wouldn't do that? Remember, I've said that DirectX does have some performance benefits in certain circumstances. But for the most part, let's call them equivalent. Well, if you're a game maker and 98% of your gamers here are here and 2% of your gamers are here, are you willing to give up a little bit of that performance for 2% of your market? Maybe not. Maybe not. So that's why these games typically came out for DirectX first. And then if the game was popular enough and they thought they could make money off it over on the Apple side, then they'd port it using OpenGL. Uh, some companies famously release games day one with uh, uh, both a Mac and a PC client. Um, one of the companies that does that, that's always done that, is a company called Blizzard. Um, but Blizzard still, even today, writes the Windows side in DirectX and the Mac side in OpenGL. Um, they have the financial ability to just write two versions of the client, um, where for the most part, it's not beneficial for a company to, to do that. Well, when we go over to mobile, we have Android and we have iOS. Android uses something called OpenGL ES. And so does iOS. So that is why now when a game comes out, um, there really isn't the situation of our arcade type of action games that are coming out for mobile where one's available for iOS but not Android. That's relatively rare for popular games. Okay. Um, you know, for little uh, mom and pop small game company shops, you might have ones that just come out for iOS or something because that's maybe just the world they work in is the iOS world. But if, you know, uh, Electronic Arts or any of these companies come out with a game or Game Loft, it's for both Android and iOS. And part of that's because they can share a large portion of the code base across OpenGLES. Okay, so this is really the third party product that both of these guys are leveraging. Now, you don't really give up performance in this case because Android and iOS both natively support OpenGLES. Okay, so this was kind of a match that both of these guys, Android and iOS, decided that they would, they would accept from day one. But when we talk about cross-platform application development, Now we have a little bit different ball game. Android uses Java um, along with their Android AWT, Abstract Windowing Toolkit, for making Android applications, business applications, things like that, or simple games. iOS uses Objective-C, slash more recently Swift and um, something called Coco. Is that how you spell Coco? That's how you spell Coco. Coco Touch. Okay. Um, so Coco Touch. Uh, before that, they had something called Coco for the uh, for the Mac standard operating system, and then they came out with Coco Touch, which is one built for touches and stuff instead of mouse clicks. All right, so this is how all this stuff is done between these two. Well, so at a glance, we can see these aren't the same technologies, right? Okay, that becomes problematic. You want to write a business app natively for iOS, you're using these technologies. You want to write a business app native for Android, you're using these technologies. So, again, we get back to this idea. Business apps typically don't require tons and tons and tons of horsepower. Okay, our computers, even our smartphones, are very fast. So 
We don't need the performance of these modern, high-level, compiled programming languages in order for the app to feel real-time in those devices. Okay? But there's still a feeling that native apps are better than cross-platform apps. There's this kind of overriding feeling that that's a truth. Okay? Um, so, when we talk about cross-platform technologies, what they're trying to do is they're trying to deliver what ends up being as close to a native app as possible without actually having to write your application twice. And that's where we have a couple of different approaches for this. Uh, let's see. So I mentioned a couple of classes ago about this idea of something called App Accelerator. So App Accelerator and PhoneGap, um, they have the ultimate, they ultimately have the same goal, but they accomplish this in different ways. App Accelerator ultimately, let's just do a thing here. Produces native code bases for each targeted platform. Right? So if you decide I'm targeting both iOS and Android with App Accelerator, you use the App Accelerator tool to design it, which is a JavaScript based tool. JavaScript or is it C sharp? Might be C sharp. Doesn't matter. Not the languages that were that those two languages are built in. You're using the App Accelerator tool to build your app, and then it <laughs> exports that app into native Java and Android AWT code or native Objective-C or Swift and Cocoa Touch code. Okay? Now, keep in mind that this guy, that program that the App Accelerator people wrote, I mean, that guy is solving somewhat of a difficult problem. You know, they're, they're saying, you're going to write your code once, and we're going to try to take what you wrote with our tool and produce a native iOS and a native Android app. Now, the quality of those two apps is going to be directly related to how good of a job App Accelerator did at mimicking, at taking their stuff and translating it into equivalent code for those platforms, right? And part of what they had to do to make that as, I guess, robust as possible is start with kind of a simple approach to that and then make it a little bit more advanced and a little bit more advanced and a little bit more advanced, all of which, even today, as it's been around for a while, is still south of what those native applications are capable of on their own. So if you were to write something natively on iOS or natively on Android, you're going to have more tools available to you. You'll be able to pull off stuff that you can't do in App Accelerator. That makes sense? Okay. But we can say that if what you're needing to do doesn't require a whole lot of really, really, really fancy stuff, App Accelerator might be a perfect tool for that. Now, PhoneGap works a little bit differently. Phone gap produces a native iOS or Android. They also support other platforms. But let's just use that as our example. Produces a native iOS or Android app that is just a HTML5 player for a phone gap. All right, so really what it comes down to is with PhoneGap, the app it's producing for iOS and Android is always the same app. And all it does is takes a PhoneGap app, which is an HTML5 application, and plays it inside of a mobile app. That make sense? So given that, their limitation is, on, is, is de derived by HTML5. Whatever you can do with HTML5, you can do with PhoneGap. And HTML5 has, again, less uh, capabilities than native stuff on either of those platforms. All right, so which is better? Well, if you want to, I would say App Accelerator allows you to make more robust apps. So PhoneGap might be kind of your quick and dirty way of pumping out um, business-like applications for multiple platforms um, that don't use a whole lot of really fancy bells and whistles. So you're not going to get a really, really polished product here, but you can still get something that looks pretty decent. Okay, this is basically writing a web page, making a web page and running it inside of a native application.
right? So your entire interface is based on what you could produce inside of a web browser. And certainly, we can get some pretty cool stuff inside of web browsers, but it's still south of what you can have running in a native application on a computer or a smartphone, which basically is a computer. Make sense? Appcelerator, on the other hand, ultimately is producing that native code for those two things, but it's still having to use kind of a subset of what's actually available on those platforms. And when something new comes out for iOS or for Android, Appcelerator isn't going to immediately support that. You might have to wait for the support to come out for that or, or something like that. All right, so a little bit different approach to the same thing. Now, again, this becomes a decision-making prob uh, problem where we're having to decide, do I... Um, write it natively and have to write it multiple times, or do I take advantage of one of these tools using different languages that might be more commonly available to, you know, for instance, on the phone gap, you're using HTML5 and JavaScript to write your phone gap, gap applications. Well, the people who are already skilled and making custom interfaces for web are already people who are skilled now at making these phone gap apps. Does that make sense? They're already going to know how to make them pretty. They don't have to rely on any sort of back knowledge of how to design an interface on iOS or design an interface on Android. Um, so this is the perfect tool for those types of folks because they can take their existing skill set and immediately apply it to mobile rather than having to go and learn a new skill. Appcelerator is really more for your um, traditional programmer um, who wants to target multiple platforms at the same time. Okay, now, I'm going to take our last two minutes, I'm going to introduce our new tool for you. <laughs> All right, so, uh, and I'll give you the website so you can at least mess with it a little bit. Uh, let's see, it's... Okay, and we're going to deal with this a lot next class, and I'll give you a homework assignment dealing with it next class, but um, you can download this. It's from Google. It's called Blockly, and you can run it on your own, but I went ahead and put it on one of my web servers, so you can actually use it. So it's awesomefat.com slash Blockly, B-L-O-C-K-L-Y, slash demos, slash code. And what it'll do is it'll produce this page. And over here, we notice that we have some different stuff that we can do. We have loops and, and things like that. What I'll do just real quick is I'm going to create a variable. Okay, we're going to call this, I'll uh, rename it, we're going to call this name. And this variable is going to have a value. Oh, actually, I that's not the right thing. Mike. And then I'll go ahead, and I think it's under text, is that print? And then I'll print my name to the screen. All right, so you, you kind of build your logic. Um, and this is using syntax. This is closer to what you're going to be learning next semester in Java, but still in a graphical way. And I can run this, and you'll see it pops up, and there's Mike. Okay? Now, what's interesting, and this is where the cross-platform thing comes in, notice that up top here it shows JavaScript, Python, Dart, and XML. If I click on JavaScript, here's the equivalent JavaScript code for defining a variable name, set an equal to mic, and uh, putting it on the screen. Here's the Python code. Here's the Dart code. Uh, XML, I don't think, makes a whole lot of sense for this, but it still produces it. Okay? It's probably how it, behind the scenes, represents what you wrote here probably stores in the XML. All right, so we'll mess with this a lot more next class and show you really what it's capable of doing, and I'm going to give you a homework assignment related to it. But this is really an example of that cross-platform type thing where we write it in this language, Blockly, and it exports it to other things. Okay, I'll see everybody on Wednesday.